Kevin Zeese, whose name might sound familiar from, well, pick an issue. Indeed, a bit like the TPP. One of his main issues at the moment, Kevin doesn't just deal with one single issue. He specializes in fighting the corporatocracy on many fronts, whether that be the TPP, single-payer healthcare, military-industrial complex, prison-industrial complex, surveillance, open internet, for which he and Margaret Flowers camped outside the FCC, Black Lives Matter, fracking, drilling, spilling, and all the others that I do not have time to mention. <laughs> On top of this, Kevin has been working on marijuana politics for the past 36 years. Yeah, that's a picture of him back in the late 80s at a hearing before DEA Judge Francis Young. Marijuana activist Mae Nutt is testifying regarding losing her son to cancer. Needless to say, this incredibly powerful testimony is not only responsible for bringing a tear to Kevin's eye, but also for pushing the judge to rule in favor of removing marijuana from a Schedule I categorization being the most dangerous and deadly categorization given by the DEA. Unfortunately, you may have noticed, the judge's ruling was overturned, and 25 plus years later, we still can't seem to figure out the difference between heroin and weed. I'll give you a hint though, overdoses. So the, and that's just one. So the fight wages on and Kevin, as usual, is on the front lines. Late last week, we sat down to talk to him about this ongoing fight. Take a look. I got into it because I was in law school and I was planning on being a criminal defense lawyer and I went to the person in charge of internships and he put me at NORML, the National Organization for Reform Marijuana Laws, back in 1979 was at George Washington University. Um, my job initially was to um, track state legislation to see what legislatures were doing and to respond to prisoner mail and prisoner family mail. So I got to see pretty much directly the impact of the injustice of marijuana prohibition on people's lives. And you saw the racism, you saw the you know, uh, undercover police abuse, you saw the prosecutorial abuse, all these kinds of issues that we are now realizing on a more wide level today, thanks to Black Lives Matter and other, other, other efforts, uh, were existing then too, and I saw all that. There were hundreds of thousands of people being arrested in those days, 350 to 450,000 a year, now we're at about 700,000 a year, so it still continues to be a big problem. But a lot has changed. Um, the biggest thing that's changed has been public opinion. Uh, now we have over 70% support, even in southern states, conservative states. You have widespread support of medical marijuana. You have uh, you know, almost two dozen states now who legalize medical marijuana. We're moving forward on regulation and taxation of marijuana. We'll see a bunch of states next election year doing that. Uh, we have already have four states legalizing. Uh, and so we're making progress on all fronts. So it's great to see an issue move. The reality is social justice takes time. Uh, it takes a lot of time for people to get over, especially something like marijuana, which has so much propaganda wrapped up in it, so much racism wrapped up in it. It takes time for people to, you know, be able to make change. And what is the main, what is the main, or what has been the main hurdle for that? You talked about, you know, prisons and you, and also, of course, big pharma has stood in the way of that. What are, what are the main hurdles, especially since, as you said, popular opinion is at 70% for legalizing marijuana? Well, it's at that, that's, that's for medical marijuana, and it's at that stage now, be, and it's new, and so I think you're starting to see change. But what really held it back, I think, was is a lot of fear and prejudice, uh, a lot of misinformation, a lot of propaganda in the public level, uh, in the um, uh, level of people profiting from the marijuana war and the drug war. You could look at every agency of federal government and see them profiting, uh, the, you know, even the Forest Service. And I mean, we've seen in Colorado that, that Colorado has made a, a, over $40 million in, in taxing uh, uh, their marijuana. So I mean, you're, you're talking about like a, a huge hurdle being the fact that even the Forest Service was getting money from the drug war. Is this going to help that shift, seeing how th there's still money to be made, so even far-right conservatives will see that they can still make money off of marijuana? Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of th other things that have changed, too. I don't think it would, we would win just by money, but I think money certainly helps. I think we win because people know the drug war is not working. If you're really afraid of marijuana, if you think it's a really dangerous drug, why would you want it to be unregulated? You know, why do you want to be uncontrolled? And if you are recognizing the reality of marijuana, which is probably one of the safest of the various drugs to choose from, uh, including drugs like tobacco and alcohol, uh, or prescri many prescription drugs, if, it's, if you see that, then you also then that makes no sense either. So what does the drug laws actually help? Does it help the person who is an occasional user and does not have a problem with it? 
Doesn't help them, makes their life a mess. It costs the government, costs the taxpayer lots of money. Does it help the person who's an addict? No, they don't need to be in prison. They need health care. They need health services. And so I think once you start to really get away from the emotion and you see how the policy just doesn't make sense no matter what perspective you look at it, uh, the change is going to come. And then having the ability to raise lots of tax dollars uh, for much needed services, that certainly adds to it. And you also sent me some information um, just yesterday that, that spoke to the, and I think you just mentioned it as well, that there's been an increase in marijuana-related arrests. Um, is this sort of like a, a you know, the a last ditch effort from the, the war on drugs to, to try and overtake the, the advocacy for legalizing marijuana? And how, how does this fit into the, the paradigm of 70% uh, uh, being for medical marijuana? And when you have 700,000 people arrested, and look at the statistics, you see that almost 90% of those are just possession arrests. So that makes it even worse. Um, I think what, what you're seeing is a, a policy in transition uh, where you have lots of states where marijuana still remains illegal and you have big police forces that are still focused on that as an easy, uh, it's almost like shooting uh, fish in a barrel, an easy arrest to make. Uh, and it does have a play into the, uh, the, the, the racial injustice system because more police are focused in uh, communities of color, uh, and that results in more arrests in those communities, and that means a record for people, that means harder to get a job, that means when you get arrested again for something, the, the more likely to go to jail, so it's just a, a kind of a bad cycle. Uh, and it, it, it's, uh, there's this whole kind of mentality that we have to overcome, that we think that just by making something illegal, we can stop it. It's not how it works. You and I, for example, uh, could be sitting here drunk, out of our minds. It's legal. We're not. Why not? Because the culture has taught us that that's not the appropriate thing to do when you're being interviewed or interviewing somebody. <laughs> uh, you know, we, and, uh, and so it's not the law that changed our behavior. It was the culture. And in fact, when you have something prohibited, it prevents that culture from developing. So in your fight with, uh, in marijuana politics, how does that tie into all of the, you, you mentioned the prison industrial complex, but how do all of the issues that you work on tie together? Well, they're all rooted in correcting injustice. And that's the first thing that connects them. I mean, we're talking about environmental justice, climate justice. We're talking about housing justice. We're talking about uh, labor justice. We're talking about, you know, on issue after issue, it's about creating justice. And that's one way they're all connected. And the second way, they're, another way they're connected is that the same roadblocks stand between us and justice. Uh, and those roadblocks are an oligarch government that resembles a democracy but isn't really one. Uh, it's kind of a mirage democracy. But I think so we see the same roadblocks of money and power protecting their status quo interests versus correcting an injustice. And that's the thing. When I worked on drug policy, uh, it started out as marijuana, but it became, it became connected to so many issues. It came in, connected to employment rights with drug testing. It came, became connected to militarism with the war on drugs in Colombia and other countries, in Bolivia and other countries. It became racism because of the disproportionate use of police and prisons and the, at every step of the criminal justice process seeing racially disproportionate effects. So uh, it became healthcare when you saw HIV being spread by, by needles uh, and the, the lack of access to, to health care became health care on lack of access to treatment. Let, you know, you basically were required to be sent by a court uh, and your insurance didn't often cover treatment. And so you had these you know, health injustices. And so it was so interesting when, even though it was a single issue I worked on for you know, 35 years now, uh, even at that stage, uh, you saw it connecting directly uh, and indirectly, it was all rooted in injustice, and we have to correct those injustices. It's, it's rooted really in bully behavior by the elites against people, people who have less power. And that, that's what really drives me in this, is I don't like bullies beating up on people in an unjust way. Lots to dig in for those interested in this issue. For more on Kevin and his work, check out popularresistance.org and tune in to him and Margaret speaking truth to expose the forces of greed on Clearing the Fog Radio every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. And you can also get one of these shirts and wear your activism, literally, on your sleeve at flushthetpp.org. <laughs>